Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about what is groove, and we're quickly going to get into the idea of music is mixtures. So a lot of the music that we deal with recording, uh, recorded mixtures. Then I'll introduce an algorithm. I'll talk about a system called Search by Groove that we've been implementing, and uh, give, give you some results from that. All right. So first of all, what is groove? But before we read through all of those references, I thought what I'd do instead is give you a more kind of pictorial auditory. Can you last your signal? That's all right. So there's a background rhythm set up here. Right, so you all know this song. I was actually on the flight over with, with Liam Gallagher. This is the behind in the passport line. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. It's funny because it sounds like he's in the studio. By now, you should have somehow realized what you gotta do. I don't believe that everybody feels the way I do about you now. The weather's on the street, but the fire in your heart is out. I'm sure you have So what I wanted to do by introducing that is the guitar riff starts off. The melody comes in. Today is gonna be day. Right? Then the drums come in. So every part is different but they're riffing off the same group, the same background rhythm. It's not the rhythm of the melody, it's not the rhythm of the bass, but there's some underlying constant background rhythm that everything else hangs on. And our hypothesis is this is a very common phenomenon in music, and so we're trying to design a system to identify that kind of background rhythm, and then to exploit it to do searching and matching. Rhythm. All right. So groove has multiple meanings. Um, it's definitely caused by rhythmic -y kind of stuff, but it could be the voice as well. Dead way. He sings it in a rhythmic way. So it's not necessarily just about what instrument is being played. It's how the instrument is being used. The voice can be used rhythmically. Um, a propulsive rhythmic feel comes from McKinsey. Jeff Films talks about timing variation and underlying rhythm. All these people have talked about groove. And then there's a whole bunch of articles that you get, they all talk about groove. They're all talking about something slightly different. But it seems, it seems to point back to there's some underlying background rhythm. All right, so let's go to a specific example. This is a spectrogram of a particular rhythm, a particular drum beat that's used over and over again. It's called the Amen Break, and if you know it, you'll recognize it. If you don't know it, if you listen to it when I play an example of it, you'll start to hear it everywhere. Uh, <laughs> Give you an example of it. So I'll play that again. So this is a kind of a background rhythm that's used in a lot of different songs. Alright, plugging back in. So this is a spectrogram of, you know, so you see the snare drums, the black band stuff here, the bass drum is the restricted to low frequency stuff here, and some high hats as well. Now, if we wanted to represent rhythm in a high level kind of way, you might think of music notation as being effective for this. All right, here's our rhythm. Now, this is the last bar. Except if we clap that out, it doesn't feel like what I just played. What you need instead is a goof. Right? So, our second hypothesis is that not only are there these background rhythms, but you really need to express the rhythm across some kind of change, like timbral change. 
So without that, you would just get a series of essentially eighth or sixteenth notes, but it's this change in the timbre that's actually creating the group. And so what we go for is we're looking at recordings, we're trying to separate out these different timbral elements <coughs> of the rhythm and look for consistent patterns in these sort of <coughs> timbre, joint timbre rhythm elements. And we're going to do this by using a component analysis where we break the spectrum up into different frequency profiles that correspond to consistent frequency, broad frequency information in the spectrum. And these have associated time profiles that are essentially the onsets of different materials. So we're going to do this using essentially matrix factorization. And there's a lot of it was a history. And actually, your, uh, your history went back to the 1960s. It's really cool to see that some of the tensile factorization is, factorization is way back. Um, I did some stuff using ICA, where we basically took the fact, same factorization model that's been, been used since, where we take a frequency profile that operates in this direction, and a time function that operates in that direction, and the matrix outer product of those two vectors forms a matrix. And you stack a bunch of these together, they're different spectrogram slices of an underlying spectrogram and you get kind of these separated layers. And, and there's a bunch of different work. Um, some early stuff is just based on the SVD and some later stuff is based on um, NMF, non-negative non matrix factorization. Here's a kind of a, the current algorithm of choice for non-negative matrix factorization is this thing called probabilistic latent component analysis or essentially, if this is your spectrogram, it consists of mixed components. You can model this as the sum of a bunch of slices. So you think of your spectrogram as being a bunch of layers that are summed together. And what we're going to try to do is access those, those layers. <coughs> so we're going to unmix those layers, essentially. And we're going to constrain the model by saying it's composed of a vertical function in our first approximation and a horizontal function. So this would be a spectral profile, and that is a time profile. And this spectrogram extends over some period of time, for example, a whole song. Right? So <coughs> this, this, this could be three or four minutes long, and we actually do decompose whole tracks like this. Um, this, this work is referencing essentially this, this paper. <coughs> OK, and here's another thing that we do, is that the if this is, um, this is a 12-band constant Q transform of the A membrane, and we see there's a, there's a lot of narrow kind of band information in there as well as white band information. And what we do is we essentially take a, a, the first few Kepstral coefficients of this log frequency transform through time, and we lift it, so we're sort of removing the high Kepstral coefficients, so left with the low Kepstral coefficients. And then we map back to the frequency domain from the Kepstral domain to get a smooth version of the spectrum that's really just expressing terminal information. It's not expressing pitch information. We don't want to really separate out layers of pitches. We want to separate out things that are like broad spectral profiles, timbre in a voice, wide band of the excitation for percussion, for example. Um, the reason why we do this and don't operate in the Kepstral domain is that our model assumes additive components. And because we're in the log domain when we go to spectrum, our components aren't additive in the way that we need them to be to work with the model. So we map back to, we invert the Kepstral transform once we've lifted, removed the high Kepstral coefficients. And that's the representation we're working with. And so what we do there is we work with a whole track um, and we use the entire temporal context. We're actually interested <coughs> in the time evolution of these um, low Q frequency um, spectra. And um, it's, it's, it's a 12 octave filter bank at the front. And we're mapping back to see uh, constant Q for A transport. OK, so this is our method. This is what we're going to do to try and access some kind of background rhythmic information and then do, do, do some matching. So we're going to extract this chamber time distribution, which is the low Q from C constant Q Fourier transform I just described. And then for each track in a collection, we're working with collections of many thousands of tracks or hundred thousands of tracks, we're going to extract this probabilistic latent component analysis. Um, but we're going to extend it by applying a hierarchical version of this. 
Um, the way we're going to extend it is we're going to estimate a universal timbre model. We're going to take the W functions, which are these, which are the um, uh, extracted latent frequency profiles. We're going to take just the W functions and throw away time for now. And we're going to stack them for all of the tracks in our database. So if I extract 10 or 20 different frequency profiles per track, I'm going to concatenate them across a whole database. And I could end up with several million of these concatenated. Then what we're going to do is we're going to estimate another PLCA on just the stacked W functions, and we're going to get a global model of these temporal functions. And now what we can do is we can go back and we can re-estimate the time functions for each track using the global basis, the universal background model. And what this solves for us is if we have these time functions per track, what it solves is the correspondence problem. If I have a time function from one track and a time function from another track, how do I know that they belong to something that sounds the same? It's the same timbre behind it. Well, I know because it maps uh, through this universal temporal model. Um, and then our rhythm features are essentially these per track time amplitude functions that belong to each of these frequency functions. And um, just to try and make that a little bit more pictorial, I didn't have infinite time to draw nice pictures, and that's, I guess, what Andy will be doing over the next few months. So <laughs> nice pictures of this stuff. <laughs> but um, basically, it comes down to this that our factorization is a, um, there's a prior probability for each slice. That's essentially the amount of energy that that slice accounts for in the entire spectrum. There's a frequency profile, which is this guy, and a time profile, which is that guy. And when you take the outer product of these things by this, with, with the scalar prior, you reconstruct one slice here. And so that's, that's, that's what we're doing. And we do this for each track in a, a global model. And um, this is what our profiles look like. This is what a frequency component looks like. This is what an amplitude profile looks like, and you can kind of guess by looking at which frequencies are at play, and which, what type of percussive instrument um, that might be, that's the membrane there. <coughs> the universal timbre model, then, basically our notation is we just stack the frequency functions given each latent index, so that there are um, ki latent slices for each track i, and we're just stacking them all together into one set, and then we do a decomposition on this whole set. All right, so the universal basis, you know, um, omega functions and the universal basis tau functions give us essentially these universal bases here. So it's a second level PLCA, so it's hierarchical. Um, then what we do is we need to map these back to each track <coughs> So we have these universal basis functions. What we actually do is we adapt the universal basis functions slightly to each track so that if the universal basis functions differ a little bit, let's say this one that corresponds to a snare drum, and the snare drum in a particular sample track is slightly different than the universal basis function, then we adapt it so slightly so that it looks more like the individual track's basis function. So it's still referencing the universal function, but it's locally adapted. That gives us a better estimate of the amplitude time distribution, which is this guy, for a given track, and it's got a hat on it because it's an estimate of the amplitude time distribution for that track's um, uh, latent component channel that's a global temperature channel. All right, so we've built this search by groove system, and essentially how this works is that we're looking for um, similarity of music content by this background groove. We do this latent feature extraction, uh, these universal timbre functions and these time functions. <coughs> um, we do some tricks. There's a, there's a sparsity constraint, sparseness constraint. The sparsity constraint on the number of components to extract using an entropic prior, which basically means that we just set some kind of global hyperparameter, which is um, a sparseness constraint, and, and we discover a kind of optimal, optimal number of components in each track. So we don't have to set how many components we're looking for. It adapts to each track, and it's globally adapted. Um, a second thing that we do is we look at the sparseness of the time functions that we get back, and we only keep those that are above a certain sparsity threshold, meaning that we're not interested in time functions that are for sustained notes. We want time functions that are for 
rhythmic information. And so we kind of do a, we reject things below a certain sparsity threshold. So there's some basic you know, tricks that go on. So we worked with this database of music that's the Ishka Guide to Electronic Music. I can just give you, if you haven't seen this on the internet, please check it out. It's, it's a completely insane website. It's fantastic. Um, but basically, if we go here, we can just listen to a little bit of going to Dog House and just play you some of, you know, uh, one or two of these things, and play uh, a few more of them. So it's the entire history of electronic music in a couple of thousand tracks or something. Um, I'll give you a con contrasting... This is apparently from the same subgenre of electronic music, Dubhouse. There are 170 different genres in the Ishka Guide, and they're all really, they sound exactly the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what we were, so, so what, what, we do, what we did, instead of using the 170 styles that came with these 4138 3 tracks, we actually gave these tracks to some professional DJs down in New York and said, please label these tracks into whatever categories you want by their rhythmic feel, and you know, try not to give too many categories, between three and five would be good, and having a done no category would be good. So we made this incredibly hard test for ourselves, which is, you know, how, um, if we label up a data set like that, can we present a system with one of the tracks, and do we recover the other tracks that were <coughs> labeled in the same, by the same category by a professional D DJ, and having set the bar pretty high, these are the results that we get. Um, the, so for retrieval, uh, for a recall rate of 5% and 10% and 20%, um, we're comparing ourselves to doing a subband only decomposition. So we take an octave subband decomposition of the spectrum and just use the amplitude outputs as, as the temporal measure. And we see that we get a divergence of 5% consistently uh, for a given re recall rate by using HPLCA versus subband. And this is an early result. This is working in progress. And we hope to do a lot better. We've got, we're, re we're sort of rethinking about how we do our evaluation. But it's early evidence that we're moving in the right direction by diverging from we subband. So our summary is that because we've got embedded <coughs> components in a mixture, we, so we, we want to match using these embedded components in their temporal context. Um, audio is mixtures, so use latent components or something else that deals with mixtures. We have a universal timbre model so that we can compare time functions from different tracks vis-a-vis -a, -vis a timbre model. That gives us the timbre time groove-based representation. And we have a simple metrics, basically, kind of dot product thing. Um, so thanks to these people. That's it.